Hey there, Calc2 folks, back here with a, uh, another little video here in my uh, lecture series looking at uh, the study of infinite series, uh, where in this section of material, section 10.6 from your book specifically, uh, is looking at the alternating series. Uh, to this point in class, we have not yet considered the alternating series. We have spent a lot of our time focused on what we call non-alternating series. And what I mean by that is term, uh, a series whose terms are, all, all, are always positive in value. Whereas what we're going to now uh, discuss is the case where we, we're looking at a series uh, where the terms uh, alternate right, between positive and negative in value. Right? So, uh, to begin with here, you will take note that uh, I'm laying out our introduction. The alternating series has terms where the sign of the terms alternate between positive and negative values. All right? They can be formally defined, right, perhaps in this manner here, folks. Right? An alternating series is a series in the form given by either the summation from k to infinity for the quantity negative 1 raised to the k plus 1 power, times some argument of k, right? Or it can be written as a summation from k equals, from k to infinity, right? Again, in this generic notation, k could actually have any lower index, right? So we're going to start just at a lower index of k and continue up to infinity for what would be the argument given by negative 1 raised to the kth power times some argument of k, right? It is these two factors of negative 1 raised to the kth plus 1 power or negative 1 raised to the kth power in the definition here of the alternating series, right, uh, that causes this alternating behavior in our series. And I present these two to illustrate how uh, controlling that power in negative 1 uh, can uh, help, help you control what signs are uh, going to be negative in a sense, right? Uh, we might begin by considering the alternating series given by this series S sub 1, right? Equal to the summation from k equals 0 to infinity for the quantity negative 1 raised to the kth plus 1 power times 1 half raised to the kth power, all right? Notice if we start at a lower index of 0, this first factor will be negative 1 raised to the power of 0 plus 1, or to the first power. Negative 1 raised to the first power is negative 1, where when multiplied by this quantity 1 half raised to the 0 power, well, anything raised to the 0 power we understand is 1. This, this quantity here, given by a sub k in our definition, this 1 half raised to the kth would be 1 in value. So negative 1 times 1 would cause our very first term in this series to be negative 1 in value. Or now if I move to my second term given here by 1 half, notice that is the case where k equals 1. When k equals 1 in this first factor, negative 1 raised to the kth plus 1 power, that would become negative 1 squared. And we know that a negative 1 raised to any even power is always going to revert back to being positive in value. So negative 1 raised to the second power will actually be positive 1 times this argument, 1 half raised to the kth power, right? Or in a sense, 1 half raised to the first power, right? Now 1 half raised to the first power is just simply 1 half. So 1 half times 1 yields 1 half in value, right? If we move to the case for k equal to 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, negative 1 to the third power now goes back to being negative, right? We understand that any odd power in negative 1 is always negative in value, right? Or negative 1 in value. So when multiplied here by 1 half now raised to the power of 2, we're looking at the case for k equal to 2, that would be 1 fourth in value. And 1 fourth times this negative 1 caused by negative 1 raised to the 2 plus 1 power will result in negative 1 fourth. And you can see down the line here, as I form the terms of these, uh, the series, uh, the terms do alternate between positive and negative in value. 
and that is caused by this quantity negative one raised to the kth plus one power in the, the argument of this alternating series. All right? Or we might consider another case here. I'm comparing the two, so I, I refer to the one as S1 and the other now as S2, where you notice there's not much difference between S1 and S2 here. In the case for S2, I also have a summation going from k equals 0 to infinity. Right? Uh, we do have that argument 1 half raised to the kth power inside this argument of the series. However, I'm considering now using the factor negative 1 raised to the kth power not negative one raised to the kth plus one power. And you will notice what happens here by using negative one to the kth instead of negative one to the kth plus one, I'm actually able to make the uh, terms, well, I should say here, make opposite terms, right, compared to the ones given above. Uh, if we consider starting at k equal to zero, well, negative one to the zero power is just one. One half to the zero power is also just one, so this would be one times one which is one in value. Whereas for the case of k equal to one, negative one to the first is negative one. One half to the first is one half. So negative one times one half would be negative one half in power. And what you will notice here is we are producing terms that are opposite of that, that we've seen back in the case for series S1. And this would continue on down the line. Again, Producing an alternating series, a series whose terms alternate between positive and negative, but in this case, starting with a positive term in that alternating series, whereas S sub 1 started with a negative term. All right? And I, I believe I actually formally point that out here in a note. Right? Note the difference between S1 and S2 is really just the signs of the corresponding terms. 1 and negative 1 have opposite signs. 1 half and negative 1 half have opposite signs. Negative 1 fourth and positive 1 fourth have opposite signs. This is the uh, second term in the series. This is the zero term in the series and so forth. All right? What's unique here about S1 and S2 is that they do have opposite signs. Again, being caused by either using negative 1 to the kth power in the series or negative 1 raised to the kth plus 1 power. All right. Now, in terms of convergence, all right, we are not going to be able to rely on the test that we've seen already presented for the cases of non-alternating series. In the case of an alternating series, we actually have what we call the alternating series test, right, which is presented here in the following theorem. If I take note, this is the alternating series test. It goes on to say an alternating series, given by either the format that we have where negative 1 raised to the kth power is incorporated as a factor, or the format we have where negative 1 raised to the kth plus 1 power is incorporated as a format. These alternating series will converge when the following conditions are true. All right. First of all, if we think about the magnitude for the terms of the series, that is what's represented here by the absolute value of these terms a sub k, what we would note is the absolute value of our terms a sub k would have to be non-increasing in value. All right? Going back to some terminology we had about sequences. All right? If the magnitude of the terms for the sequence a sub k are non-increasing, that is the first condition that must be true in the uh, what we call alternating series test. The second condition that must be true is if we look at the limit as k heads to infinity for the arguments given by a sub k in these series. Right? If that argument or if that limit of those arguments a sub k equals zero, the series must converge. Right. Alternating series converge if these following two conditions are true. Right? It's actually a uh, very similar to the divergence test, folks. Except in the case, if we tried the, to use the divergence test on a non-alternating series, 
Remember what we're looking for in the divergence test applied to a non-alternating series is the case where the limit does not equal zero. When the limit does not equal zero for it, the divergence test, we're able to say that the series diverges. In the divergence test, if we were to calculate this value known, seen as this limit here, and it equaled zero, back in the divergence test, we said that the test was inconclusive. Whereas now, if we are dealing with the case of an alternating series, right, when we evaluate this limit, if this limit does equal zero, right, we do have the case for a convergent alternating series provided that the uh, magnitude for the terms of the series are what we call non-increasing in value. All right. So let's consider the alternating harmonic series. All right. This is a series that looks a lot like the harmonic series, All right. but this is referred to as the non-alternating series, or alternate, sorry, back up. This is a series known as the alternating harmonic series. All right. Note, if we spend a moment here, the terms, right, given by the absolute value of a sub k equal to the absolute value of 1 over k, from k equals 1 to up to the value of infinity, right, are non-increasing in value, right? That first condition holds true, where we can also point out if we evaluate the limit as k heads to infinity for this argument 1 over k, right? the limit as k heads to infinity for that argument a sub k in our series, 1 over k, does equal 0. Right? From our fundamental rules for limits at infinity, this would equal the value of 0. So with this condition being true and this condition being true, we're able to say by the alternating series test, what we know as the alternating harmonic series is what we call a convergent series. All right? It is convergent. Now, I point this out because if you think back when we, we were looking at just the harmonic series, recall the harmonic series that was non-alternating was not convergent. Right? It was what we call a divergent series. All right? By adding this alternating aspect to the harmonic series, we are actually able to make it convergent. Right? It does behave in a rather convergent manner. All right? I do think I have another example for us here. All right? Oh, hold on. Well, what I don't have, I don't have another example for you. What I actually have is a way to begin thinking about approximating right, an alternating series, all right? In terms of approximating a convergent alternating series, much like the way we approximated a non-alternating series, is that we're going to rely upon using the value of S sub n, which is the sum of the first n terms in the convergent alternating series, and we're going to rely a little bit on R sub n, R sub n equal to S minus S sub n, what we understand is the remainder we have using S sub n to approximate S. All right? The following theorem we have gives us, to begin with, a note on the behavior of R sub n, how this remainder is going to behave in this case. Here the theorem states, right? Suppose S is a convergent alternating series with terms that are non-increasing in magnitude. If S sub n is the sum of the first n terms in the series, and R sub n is that remainder equal to S minus S sub n, then what is going to be true about the absolute value of R sub n, the absolute value of this remainder, is that it will always be smaller than or equal to what we understand as a sub n plus 1. a sub n plus 1 is the nth plus 1 term in this series. And perhaps we ought to come down here and maybe say that. Uh, this is all where yeah, 
a sub n plus 1, right, is the, what we think of as n plus 1th term in the alternating series, right, is the, what we might say is the, uh, in the alternates is the here's where I'm drawing issue ah uh, this value of a sub k actually is playing the role given right here is a sub k given by this value here so what we may be ought to note here uh, if s sub n equals Hmm. Let's say it this way, where instead of looking at this as a quantity here, let's draw this out as the absolute value of a sub n plus 1. I think that would be a little nicer, right? Work for us a little better. That is going to be a positive value, right? And that's really what we're trying to make sure is that we are talking about this always being less than or equal to this positive value because we are talking about an absolute value where when we think about a sub n plus 1, right, it is then we, we can clearly define just as the nth plus 1 term in the alternating series. And we don't necessarily have to pay too much attention to the sign of that, right? But if we do take then the absolute value of that with its sign included, it will always be positive. And by making the statement that the absolute value of r sub n, which is going to be uh, a bit of our variable value in this case being less than or equal to this positive quantity. What we're able to say about r sub n is that r sub n must be stuck between these two values. What would be the opposite of, now what I probably ought to do, and I think we'll be all right saying this. I think this might make it a little clearer. At least it does for me. R sub n must be stuck between the negative of this absolute value of the nth plus 1 term in the ser alternating series and must be less than or equal to the positive value of that nth plus 1 term. And this must be true about our value of R sub n. We saw a similar result back in the case for non-alternating series. However, if you think back to that scenario, uh, our calculation for the boundaries on r sub n was a little bit more complex. These boundaries on our value of r sub n in this case have really been simplified considerably. We really just have to consider what is the nth plus one term in our alternating series and compare the absolute value of r sub n to its absolute value. Back in the non-alternating case, r sub n's bounds were actually defined by improper integrals and it required a much heavier calculation to determine those bounds. Here, it's simplified considerably. All right. Now, this does have some implications. We'll note, and let's fix this down below here, with what I am describing. Uh, note, since r sub n is equal to s minus n, s minus s sub n, for the given result in this theorem, r sub n being stuck between the opposite of this absolute value and the absolute value of the nth plus one term itself implies that s minus s sub n must be between the opposite of the absolute value of the nth plus one term and the absolute value of the nth plus one term itself. Or if we actually solve this for s by adding s sub n to all three sides of this inequality, the two outsides and the one inside, we will have s sub n must be or s must be greater than or equal to s sub n minus the absolute value of the nth plus 1 term, or s must be less than or equal to s sub n plus the absolute value of the nth plus 1 term. And what this is going to yield is what we think of as this interval approximation for the value of s. s must be stuck between these two outer bounds on this interval. All right? we look at an example, right, we might consider the value of the convergent alternating harmonic series. 
And let me clarify that. We are looking at the convergent alternating harmonic series, right? And let's consider using S sub 10 and R sub 10 to approximate this value. Where we begin in our approximation is actually calculating the value of S sub 10. You may need to use your calculator to do this. This would be a little tricky by hand in its calculation or use uh, Mathematica to do this, right? But it can certainly be done on a calculator, right? Adding up these 10 terms will give us our value of S sub 10. Where if we perform that calculation, that will give us negative 1627 divided by 2560 which is approximately negative 0 0.645635 in value, where there I am going out to what three, uh, sorry, six significant digits in that approximation, all right? Note, this would be the value of the first 10 terms in this alternating harmonic series. As for the value of R sub 10, <coughs> excuse me, from the theorem above, the absolute value of R sub 10, right, from the theorem above must be less than or equal to what we might say is the, let's go back and fix this, the absolute value of A sub 11, the 11th term in the series. Implying for a value of A sub K equal to one over K, right, the absolute value of a to the 11th is 1 to the 11th. Now, the reason I did make these adjustments above was because my a sub k here that I'm actually defining, I've thought of as defining as a negative 1 raised to either the kth power or raised to the kth plus 1 power. Now, in this case, it's negative 1 raised to the kth power. So, applying for a sub k equal to this value, if we're just looking at the terms of the series in general, this term or this term or that term in general, right? Applying for a sub k equal to this, right? R sub 10 must be between the absolute value of a sub 11, right? We might note the absolute, or well, let's say it this way, a sub Eleven then would be equal to negative one eleventh in this series, right? If we were to add up beyond this one tenth in value and consider this eleventh term, that would be negative one eleventh. And what do we know about R sub ten is that it is stuck between the absolute value, right, of that on the upper end and the opposite of that absolute value on the lower end which does allow me to conclude if right, I added another statement here then uh, R sub 10 then right, must be smaller than 1 11th in value on the upper end and on the lower end be greater than negative 1 over 11 in value and you can see the approximation for R sub 10 here is a much simpler calculation than we had seen in the case for a non-alternating series. All right. And we can go on then to say, well, since R sub 10 is equal to S minus S sub 10, S minus S sub 10 must be stuck between this positive and negative value for negative 1 11th, negative 1 11th. 11th on the low end and 1 11th on the high end. Where if I now solve for S by adding S sub 10 to both sides, or well, not both sides, all three sides, the two outsides and the inside, we're able to say that S must be greater than or equal to S sub 10 minus 1 11th, and at the same time S must be less than or equal to S sub 10 plus 1 11th. And since S sub 10 was equal to negative 1,627 divided by 2560, S must be stuck between this difference, right? Um, negative 1,627 divided by 2560 minus 1 11th. 
and on the low end and on the high end s must be less than or equal to negative 16 27 divided by 25 60 plus 111th all right and if i go about approximating that value using my calculator or some other program like mathematica well i can calculate the exact fractional value here as seen on these two uh, bounds uh, s is bigger than the fraction negative 20,416 over 27,720. And S must be less than or equal to the fraction given by negative 15,377 divided by 27,720. Which if I go to approximate that value, right, that approximation for S then has it somewhere between negative 0 0.736544 in value and negative 0 0.554726 in value, where in each of these approximations, I went ahead and, and rounded out the uh, six significant digits. All right. You'll notice here that uh, unlike the non-alternating series, our approximation of S lacks a little precision for low values of N. All right. Uh, if we use small values, or if we don't count too far into an alternating series as we had done in this case, only counting up through the first 10 terms, and using that as an approximation, we really do get a, a rather, uh, what we might consider a, a vast approximation, a, an interval approximate here that, that does cover quite a few values. We, we don't really have much precision. We, we, you know, we can see the lower and upper bound differ by almost as much as, what, two-tenths of a value between 0.5 and 0.7 in value on the negative end, All right? So th this does lack a little bit of precision that we, we gain pretty early in the case for approximating non-alternating series. But keep in mind, you can always continue this approximation and make it more precise by using larger values of n in your approximation, or using larger values of n in your calculation of s sub n, right? That's sum of the first n terms in our series. All right. Now there is one last idea that we want to bring out here. And this is a bit more terminology. This is a, some terminology that we do encounter when working, working with alternating series. And, and the idea of them being convergent. All right. Uh, when an alternating series is convergent, there are two types of convergence that could be occurring. Right. When we're dealing with a convergent alternating series, there are two types of convergence that we could have happen. And those are summarized here in this following definition. Right. And what they involve is looking at the behavior for what would be the a series formed by taking the absolute values of the terms in that uh, that alternating series. All right? If the absolute value of the terms found in an alternating series also converge, then what we can often say about that alternating series is that it is absolutely convergent or it converges absolutely. Whereas if the absolute value for the terms in an alternating series happen to diverge, but the alternating series itself is convergent, then the terms of that alternating series, or then I should really say then that alternating series converges conditionally. Right, and maybe we ought to set up a little assumption here. Let's assume. Let's go with uh, suppose series uh, k. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me back up here. Summation from k to infinity for a. Yeah, let's just go with simply a sub k describes an alternating series. Let's establish that, right? Suppose what we're discussing here with this infinite series given here or given here, 
that's either converging absolutely or converging conditionally, right, is what we think of as being an alternating series, right? If you take the absolute value of that alternating series and it converges, you also have an alternating series that converges absolutely. And if you take the absolute value of an alternating series and it diverges, but the alternating series itself is convergent, then that alternating series that converges is known to converge conditionally. Let's look at some example. We might go back to that alternating harmonic series to begin with, right? If we consider the alternating harmonic series, right, it is known that this was a convergent series, right? We had determined this above. However, if we take the absolute value of this alternating series, what it does yield in return is the harmonic series, right? Taking this alternating series given here, the alternating harmonic series, and taking its absolute value of these terms on the inside, that absolute value is going to distribute itself across these two factors. It'll apply itself to this term that is alternating between negative and positive values for one, times this, careful there, I should say call factor, this factor that alternates between negative and positive one in value, and it will distribute across this factor, right, from one, uh, given by one over k, right? Actually, if we maybe set this up, we might throw in another quick middle statement here and say something like, uh, if we think about this absolute value, it will distribute across these two values given here. So let me go ahead and bring this down, a little bit more space. Or when we think about that result, let me go ahead and put that in front here. That would be given by the uh, summation from k equals 1 up to infinity for what would be, now, when the absolute value applies itself to this term, or I careful again, this factor in our term that is alternating between negative and positive 1 in value, that is always just going to be 1 to the kth power, or just going to always be the value of 1. When the absolute value then applies itself to the value 1 over k, where k starts at 1 and continues up to infinity, well, this interior is always going to be positive. So its absolute value will always remain positive and have very little effect. And what we would be able to say is that this would be given by 1 over k in value. And 1 times 1 over k in value is simply 1 over k. And what we might go back and note is what we have here in, in an end result is just the harmonic series. And what do we know about the harmonic series? It is a divergent series, right? A divergent P series. Right? Where uh, we understand P was equal to the value of one. Right? Let's go ahead and start a new sentence here. So, the convergent alternating series is more specifically defined as being a conditionally convergent series. It fits the second definition here for conditionally convergent, right? Because the alternating series itself converges, but its absolute value is divergent, right? The alternating series, in a sense, is only convergent based upon the case, or based upon the condition that it happens to alternate. Removing the alternating nature from the alternating harmonic series produces just the harmonic series, which in turn then is a divergent series. All right? Changing the alternating into non-alternating in this case created a divergent result. That is the case for conditionally convergent alternating series. Right. We'll finish with that. And then we have one other example here. Whereas if we consider the alternating P series, right, given by this 
alternating series here, where we have negative 1 raised to the kth plus 1 power, times 1 over k squared. That is the series from k equals 1 to infinity given by 1 minus 1 fourth plus 1 ninth minus 1 sixteenth plus 1 fifteenth, and so forth. And what we can note is this alternating series is convergent, right? Since the terms are non-increasing in magnitude, and the limit as k heads to infinity for 1 over k squared equals the value of 0. Right? These terms are non-increasing in their absolute value. And the limit as k heads to infinity for this quantity, the sequence here, 1 over k squared, does equal 0. So this is a case of an alternating. This, is a, this alternating series is a case for a convergent series. Also note... If we go back and now take the alternating or the absolute value of this alternating series, right? The absolute value of this alternating series is going to remove this factor, or in a sense, negate this factor that is causing the alternating behavior. It is going to produce this result here, which we understand is a convergent P series where P is equal to 2. So since the alternating series is convergent and its absolute value is also convergent, what we know is that this alternating P series then must be what we call absolutely convergent. All right, folks, that does uh, wrap up our uh, lecture here on alternating series, right? Uh, this Section 10.6 does introduce them right at the beginning. We see our definition for the alternating series. It does give us our test for determining convergence or divergence in an alternating series. All right. It gives us, uh, if I can scroll down and see it, this method for approximating alternating convergent series. And I, I didn't really go into the proof here of this, folks, for the sake of time, but the proof of this result here is very similar to the proof we saw back in the case for non-alternating series. It is a bit of a graphical proof that you could take note on. I do believe the book shows us that, right? Uh, but then the, the uh, last thing that this section does introduce is a little bit more terminology that allows us to be a little bit more descriptive on the convergence of alternating series, and that is these terms of converging absolutely and converging conditionally. All right, folks. Um, again, like I said, that is our a little lecture here over alternating series. I do have one more lecture in this uh, Chapter 10 material where we're looking at uh, our study of just infinite series and sequences. Uh, before we move over into some chapter 11 material where I'm going to introduce to you uh, the case for a power series which is a special case of infinite series and more specifically we're going to delve into the special cases of power series known as Taylor series and their corresponding what we call Taylor polynomials and how all of those uh, cases play a role in our calculus. But, folks, uh, I hope you're out there doing well. I hope you're surviving. I hope everything is uh, okay for you. I know these are not the best conditions, and we're, we're doing the best we can to cope with all this. Uh, if you do have questions, keep in mind I am in that uh, Collaborate classroom all week long for 12 hours out, out, out of the week for on uh, three every day on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, morning, afternoon, and evening. So make sure that you're... Uh, jumping into those times and, and trying to get some questions answered if you are struggling with this, folks. Uh, the, the next couple of weeks are going to go very, very quickly, even though it may not seem like it, and I don't want you to get overwhelmed in the end. All right, folks, I hope you're all doing well, and I...